Shalom, welcome back. I'm going to go through this introduction a little bit quicker than usual. It's going to be kind of a long video, I believe. Um, we're going to finish out chapter 6 today using a couple of books as my guide. Uh, the Mysteries History by Adam Drissel, um, Back to the Future by Ralph Bass. My views don't necessarily reflect the views of the authors, but both of these books give you some good information as far as linking to the historical fulfillment of a lot of these events. And um, so I recommend either one of them. Okay, jumping right into it. Uh, Revelation 6-7. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And I looked and saw a pale horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades followed with him. And authority was given unto them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death by the beasts of the earth. So this... Uh, this horseman, of course, uh, the fourth horseman, is uh, death, and he is uh, bringing death uh, from the sword and from hunger, and it says, with death. And it's kind of this uh, interesting way the scripture sometimes will will refer to uh, past, what I think is pestilence, where he says, you will die with death. <laughs> um and I think that's probably what's being intended here. Uh, beast of the earth. This this could be literal beast of the earth. I know there's stories in the Bible of people being killed by lions and bears and such. But um, a lot of times when it talks about the beasts of the earth, it would be um, governmental systems. And of course, the number one um, killer of... Uh, humans throughout history has been uh, democide, which is death by government. So uh, the beasts of the earth are definitely uh, very dangerous, especially when you're considering the, the governments to be beasts. So uh, just to look at the sheer, the sheer amount of death that was experienced during this uh, war of the Jews, the Jews against uh, Rome, uh, we turn to Josephus in his... Uh, uh, work uh, wars of the Jews now the number of those that were carried captive during this whole war were collected to be 97,000 as were the number of those that perished during the whole siege 1100,000 and uh, of course 1100,000 that's 1.1 million the greater part of whom were indeed of the same nation with the city's citizens of Jerusalem but not belonging to the city itself for they were come up from all the country to the feast of unleavened bread and were on a sudden shut up by an army which at the very first occasioned so great a straightness among them that there came a pestilential destruction upon them as soon afterwards a famine as destroyed them more suddenly. So to, to put this in plain language, um, out of that 1.1 million, most were uh, citizens of Judea. Not all of them were citizens of Jerusalem, but the siege began at the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and they were basically closed up in the city by an army, uh, unexpectedly. And that because they were all shut up in the city together, um, pestilence broke out, and of course afterwards a famine. Revelation 6, 9, And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those having been slain for the word of Elohim, and for the witness which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Master, set apart and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each a white robe, and they were told that they should rest a little longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brothers who would be killed as they were was completed. So even as this is going on um, in Jerusalem and the Jews are being put under siege, there's still um, martyrs are being killed for their faith in Yeshua because of the witness which they held, as the, the reading says. Again, we go back to Luke 21, Matthew 24, where um, Yeshua's des description of the day of Yahweh parallels with the description that we see from John in the book of Revelation. Luke uh, 12, uh, 
I'm sorry, Luke 21, starting at verse 12. But before all this, they shall lay, ha- lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the congregations and prisons, and be brought before uh, sovereigns and rulers for my name's sake, and it shall turn out to you for a witness. Therefore, I resolve, therefore resolve in your hearts not to premeditate on what to answer, for I shall give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to refute or resist. And you shall also be betrayed by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you shall be put to death. You know, sometimes in the church, there's this um, belief that because you're a Christian, you're going to be shielded from persecution. But um, as we know, historically and from Yeshua's own words, that's not the case. Um, Some of you will be put to death and you shall be hated by all because of my name. But not a hair on your head shall be lost at all. Possess your lives by your endurance. Matthew uh, 24, 8. And all these are the beginnings of birth pains. Then they shall deliver you up to affliction and kill you, and you shall be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And uh, back to Revelation, uh, Revelation 6, 12. And I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, I saw a great earthquake came to be. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its unripe figs, being shaken by a strong wind. And heaven departed like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the rich ones, and the commanders, and the mighty, and every slave, and every free one, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains." And they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him sitting on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So if you watch the uh, first couple of videos, you should recognize a lot of these terms as those uh, code words that we uh, put that chart on screen uh, that said, you know, this this sign in a in prophecy represents this in the physical, and that was put together by uh, Isaac Newton. He he went and compared all the prophecies in in the Old Testament and looked at what these different prophecies meant, what these different signs meant, what what the sun represented, what the stars represented, and such and so forth. And he put together this this. Uh, what we have now is this chart. So we'll get to that in a moment, and we'll go through what all these represent. But first, I do want to take a moment to go through some of the prophecies from the Tanakh that do reflect similar wording, um, similar signs. So uh, the first one's in Joel. This is probably the most obvious parallel. Uh, Joel 2.28, And after this it shall be that I pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men dream dreams, your young men see visions, and also on the male servants and on the female servants I shall pour out my spirit in those days. And I shall give signs in the heaven and upon the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun has turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of Yahweh. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh shall be delivered. For on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem there shall be an escape, as Yahweh has said, and among the survivors whom Yahuwah calls. So here we have, uh, this This is the same verse, of course, that, that Peter referred to in the book of Acts when uh, the disciples had the Holy Spirit descend upon them in tongues of fire. He referred to this same prophecy. Now, notice that the first part here in verses 17 through 18, it's speaking about the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples. And no one debates that 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 part of this prophecy was fulfilled in the first century. But Peter himself is also reciting the second half of this prophecy. I shall show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the great, before the coming of the great and splendid day of Yahweh. So it's obvious that Peter was expecting that half of the prophecy to be fulfilled in their day also, also not just the first part. Isaiah 2.12 
for Yahweh of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, so that it is brought low, and against all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and against all the oaks of Bashan, and against all the high mountains, and against the hills that are lifted up. Okay, so uh, the symbology of the cedars of Lebanon, uh, the oaks of Bashan, this is about uh, rulers and principalities and men of stature. The high mountains are the uh, important cities. The hills are the smaller cities and villages. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down. So you see that that ties into, okay, so the, the, those two verses in 13 and 14 are the symbolic imagery of these kings and important villages and towns. Verse 17, it says, And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down. So that's kind of the physical fulfillment of those other two verses. And the pride of men shall be brought low, and Yahweh alone shall be exalted on that day, and the idols completely pass away. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the dread of Yahweh and the splendor of his excellency. When he arises to shake the earth mightily, in that day man shall throw away his idols of silver and idols of gold, which they made each for himself to worship, to the moles and bats, to go to the clefts of the rocks and to the crags of the rugged rocks because of the fear of Yahweh and the splendor of his excellency when he arises to shake the earth mightily. And of course, this, the symbology of shaking the earth is uh, overturning kingdoms. Hosea 10, 8, In the high places of Awan, the sin of Israel shall be destroyed. Thorn and thistle come up on their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, Cover us, and to the hills, Fall on us. Isaiah 34, 2, For this displeasure of Yahweh is great against the Gentiles, and his wrath against all their divisions. He shall put them under the ban. He shall give them over to the slaughter, and their slain shall be thrown out, and their stench rise from their corpses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood, and all the hosts of the heavens shall rot away. And the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll, and all the host fade like a leaf fading on the vine, and like the fading one of a fig tree. For my sword shall be drenched in the heavens. Look, it comes down on Edom and on the people of my curse for judgment. Years ago, I read a, uh, a really good book, a um, really informative book called um, Who is Esau slash Edom? And the author of that book made the case that the modern-day Jews, the, the rabbinical Jews, were actually the descendants of Edom and not the descendants of uh, Judah. I've got my own understanding of that now, uh, slightly different, somewhat different, but um, and I'll get into that in a future video. <clears throat> but... If we're looking at the book of Revelation as this divorce, uh, where, where Yahweh is divorcing Judah, <clears throat> so let's just let's kind of say frankly what's happening um, with the opening of these seals. Yahweh is divorcing Judah. So originally he he gave um, Israel this bill of divorcement, and we see in the book of Jeremiah, he is he's later saying, well, Judah's even worse than Israel, and he is calling for Israel to return to him, and at the same time, he is giving an indictment against Judah. So what I think is going on in the book of Revelation is he is divorcing Judah, and he is, uh, later you'll see this, uh, you know, the wedding supper of the Lamb, and I think that is him calling Israel back, and the righteous of Judah have now attached themselves to Israel. And so now, that is what this this wedding feast is, um, and of course Israel today would be the Christians. So um, the only the only Jews that are still wed to Yahweh would be um, the Messianic Jews. So if you're not a believer in Yeshua, then you're not the uh, the bride of of Yahweh any longer, because the uh, the non the the only Jews that are still wed to Yahweh would be the ones that are through Yeshua. <clears throat> but here, you know, it's calling down this curse upon Edom and is speaking about the Gentiles. Well, once Yahweh divorces Judah, Judah becomes Gentiles, which is kind of ironic because they're the ones now that are uh, that are still you know, viewing 
non-Jews as being the Goyim, but they themselves are the Goyim, and that uh, Israel itself is now the Christians. So this nation of Israel in the Middle East is not is not true Israel. It is someone who stole this title from the from real Israel, which is of course the Christians. <clears throat> Again, we have this reference to the fig tree and learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. So you also, when you see all these, know that he is near at the doors. Truly I say to you, this generation shall by no means pass away until this all takes place. The heaven and the earth shall pass away, but my word shall by no means pass away. So again, this is Matthew 24, which is, it's all about, it, it, you can't read the book of Revelation without referring to Matthew 24 and Luke 21. He spoke a parable to them, look at the fig tree and all the trees, when they have already budded, observing it, you know that for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these matters take place, know that the kingdom, the reign of Elohim is near. Truly I say to you, this generation shall by no means pass away till all shall have been taken place. The heaven and the earth shall pass away, but my words shall by no means pass away. And another passage in Luke I do want to just uh, mention is uh, Luke twenty-three, twenty-seven, And a great number of the people were following him, and women also were mourning and lamenting him. But Yahweh tur- or Yeshua turning to them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For look, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts which never nursed. Then they shall begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. Because if they do this to the green tree, which is Yeshua, it's a green tree, what's going to be done to the dry tree? So you see this same symbology all kind of tying back together. Okay, so we're going to go back through um, the passages in Revelation, and we're going to look at the symbology of these different terms that are used. Revelation 6.12, And I looked when he opened the sixth seal and saw a great earthquake came to be. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So, again, like we said before, shaking of the heavens or earthquakes is a shaking of kingdoms. So you're going to see a disturbance in the kingdom, in the the different nations. Uh, So this would be both um, Rome and Judea and probably some of the other nations around them also. This is going to be, a, you know, it's a great earthquake. So there's lots of unsettlement coming. The sun becoming black and the moon becoming as blood. Well, uh, the setting of the sun and the moon can be the ceasing of a kingdom or the desolation thereof. And it's proportional to the, to the darkness. So the sun becoming black is very dark. Um... There were some things that happened during this war. Uh, one of the things was that Caesar Nero died. I mean, that would be the sun becoming black. The sun, of course, remember that that represents um, kings in a nation. So that would definitely be Caesar in um, Rome. Uh, the Jewish leadership was, of course, also a lot of them were killed. Um, the moon represents the body of the common people considered as the king's wife and so the moon becoming becoming as blood uh, I think the symbology is pretty obvious there um, it's talking about the death deaths of lots of the moon you know the, the people lots of people died um, it could also be just the death of a class of people uh, after this war between the Jews and the Romans um, the Jews for the most part were a displaced people and they have been for the last 2,000 years Revelation 6.13, And the stars of the heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its unripe figs, being shaken by a strong wind. So again, uh, this symbology of the fig tree that Yeshua used to refer to the nation of Israel, or I'm sorry, the nation of Judea. Um, The stars represent subordinate princes and great men or bishops and rulers. And then ascending to heaven or descending to earth is the rise and fall of a nation. So the stars falling to the earth would be uh, depending on who these stars represent if it's representing the religious leaders I mean definitely they fell when the, when the temple fell um, 
subordinate princes and great men. That could be the Herods or uh, any of the leaders within the uh, within Judea. Six fourteen, and the heavens departed like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Uh, mountains and islands would be the cities of the earth and a sea politic. So there were cities, entire towns and cities were destroyed during this war. Uh, the dens and the rocks of mountains represent the temples of cities. So when we see that the, uh, you know, the hiding of men in these dens and rocks would be the sh shutting up of idols in their temples. And the sovereigns of the earth, um, and the great ones, and the rich ones, and all the commanders, and the mighty ones, and every slave, and every free one, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him sitting in the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb. Because the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? With this one, the certainly the the hiding of the men in those dens and rocks could be the shutting up of idols in their temples but i, I think that this is also literal that the there were men literally hiding in the rocks to avoid the judgment so we're going to go through some of the uh, writings of josephus where he talks about the different signs that were seen there in judea thus were the miserable miserable people persuaded by these deceivers and such as beguiled god himself while they did not attend nor give credit to the signs that were so evident and did so plainly foretell their future desolation but like men infatuated without either eyes to see or minds to consider did not regard the denunciation that god made to them thus there was a star resembling a sword which stood over the city and a comet that continued a whole year Kind of sounds like uh, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, right? Thus also before the Jews' rebellion and before those commotions which preceded the war when the people were come to great crowds to the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the eighth day of the month, um, Zanishus, which is Nisan, and at the ninth hour of the night, so great a light shone round the altar and the holy house that it appeared to be bright daytime, which lasted for about half an hour. The light seemed to be a good sign to the unskillful, but was so interpreted by the sacred scribes to be uh, as to portend those events that followed immediately upon it. So, um, you know, sign of the Son of Man in heaven. We had um, this light at the altar that lasted for half an hour. I've got a theory about what that is, and we'll talk about that later. Um, he goes on, uh, same chapter. And at the same festival also, a heifer, as she was led by the high priest to be sacrificed, brought forth the lamb in the midst of the temple. Moreover, the eastern gate of the inner court of the temple, which was of brass and vastly heavy, and had been with difficulty shut by twenty men, and rested upon a basis armed with iron, and had bolts fastened very deep into the firm floor, which was there made of one entire stone, was seen to be open of its own accord about the sixth hour of the night. Now those that kept watch in the temple came hereupon running to the captain of the temple and told him of it, and who then came up thither, and not without great difficulty, as was able to shut the gate again. This also appeared to the vulgar to be a very happy prodigy, as if God did thereby open them the gate of happiness. But the men of learning understood it, that the security of their holy house was dissolved of its own accord, and that the gate was open for the advantage of their enemies. So these publicly declared that the signal foreshadowed the desolation that was coming upon them. <clears throat> so this eastern gate, you know, there's a lot of, um, I don't know if you would call it mythology or, you know, beliefs that are around both the Jews and the Christians that believe that when, Yeshua returns, he's going to enter through that eastern gate. And Ezekiel mentions the eastern gate several times. Um, if you want to go through the book of Ezekiel and look at the times he, he mentions the east gate, it might be an interesting study for you to do. He mentions it four or five times. Um, this is one that I picked out. It says, And he led me to the gate, the gate facing east, and see the esteem of the Elohim of Israel came from the way of the east. And his voice was like the sound of many waters, uh, which would be many people. And the earth shone from his esteem. 
And it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when he came to destroy the city. Um, and the visions were like the vision I, which I saw by the river river Kabar, and I fell upon my face, and the esteem of Yahweh came upon came into the house by way of the gate facing east. And the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner courtyard and see the esteem of Yahweh filled the house. In another passage, Ezekiel says he saw the Holy Spirit leaving through the east gate. Um, so this this east gate is, is very um, important when it comes to prophecy and um, the day of Yahweh. Back to Josephus. Besides these, a few days after that feast, on the one and twentieth day of the month, Artemisus, or Yair, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon occur occurred. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable, were not related by those that saw it, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before sun setting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their army were seen running out amongst the clouds and surrounding of cities. Moreover, at the feast we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was, to perform the sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a great quaking and heard a great noise, and after that they heard a sound of a great multitude saying, Let us remove hence. So this is uh, another one of these really interesting passages where they report that they saw um, soldiers actually fighting in the clouds, like angelic beings fighting a war over the war that was being fought on the ground. But what is still more terrible, there was one Yeshua, the son of Ananias, a plebeian and a husbandman. So that would be like the plebeians are the, the poor people. So a poor person and a farmer, a husbandman, it's a farmer, who four years before the war began and at a time when the city was in great peace and prosperity came to that feast whereon it is our custom for everyone to make tabernacles to God in the temple. And it began on a, certain, on a sudden to cry aloud, a voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and the holy house, a voice against the bridegrooms and the brides, and a voice against the whole people. Okay, so the four winds, a voice from the four winds, again, that refers to the four horsemen. Um... This, you know, when I, when I read this passage about these against the brides and the bridegrooms, it reminded me of what Yeshua said about as in the days of Noah, for people were eating and drinking and giving in marriage, and then destruction came upon them. And the fact that, again, you hear the, the bridegrooms and the brides are mentioned, um, to me, in my mind, it, it ties it back to that verse. Um, this was his cry as he went out about day and by night in all the lanes of the city. However, certain of the most eminent among the populace had great indignation at this dire cry of his, and took up the man and gave him a great number of severe stripes, yet did not either say anything for himself or anything peculiar to those that chastised him, but still went on with the same words which he cried before. Hereupon our rulers, supposing as the case provided to be, that this was a sort of divine fury in the man, brought him to the Roman procurator, where he was whipped till his bones were laid bare, yet he did not make any supplication for himself, nor shed any tears, but turning his voice to the most lamentable tone possible, and at every stroke, stroke of the whip, his answer was, Woe, woe to Jerusalem. And when Albinius, for he was then our procurator, asked him, who he was, and whence he came, and why he uttered such words, he made no manner of reply to what he heard, but still did not leave off his melancholy ditty, till Albinius took him to be a madman and dismissed him. Now it, now during the time that he that passed before the war began, this man did not go near any of the citizens, nor was seen by them while he said so, but he every day uttered these lamentable words as if it was his premeditated vow, woe, woe to Jerusalem. Now to me, this sounds like one of the two witnesses that's spoken about later in the book of Revelation. Um, but the way that Josephus describes the guy, it almost sounds like he was a robot or something, just walking around, woe, woe to Jerusalem for years. And nothing could stop him. No matter how much they beat him, he would continue to say it. Nor did he give ill words to any of those that beat him every day, nor good words to those that gave him food, but this was his reply to all men, and indeed no other than a melancholy presage of what was to come. 
This cry of his was the loudest at the festivals, and he continued this ditty for seven years and five months, without growing hoarse or being tired therein, until the very time that he saw his presage in earnest fulfilled in our siege, when it ceased, for he was not for hit. As he was going around upon the wall, he cried out with his utmost force, Woe, woe to the city again, and to the people, and to the holy house. And just as he added at the last, Woe, woe unto myself also, there came a stone out of one of the engines. Uh, that would have been the catapult. So he got hit by one of the stones from the catapult. It smote him and killed him immediately. And as he was uttering the very same uh, presages, presages, he gave up the ghost. And then we also have this uh, uh, testimony from Tacitus in his book, uh, Histories, in Book 5, Chapter 13. Prodigies had occurred, which this nation prone to superstition, but hating all religious rites and did not deem it lawful to expiate any by offering offerings of sacrifice. There had been seen hosts joining in battle in the skies, the fiery gleam of arms, the temple illuminated by a sudden radiance from the clouds, the doors of the inner shrine were suddenly thrown open, and a voice of more than mortal tone was heard to cry that the gods were departing. At the same instant, there was a mighty stir of departure. Some few put a fearful meaning on these events, but in most, there was a firm persuasion that in the ancient records of their priest was contained a prediction of how at this very time the East was going to grow powerful and rulers coming from Judea were to acquire universal empire. These mysterious prophecies had pointed to Vespasian and Titus, but the common people with the usual blindness of ambition had interpreted these mighty destinies of themselves and could not be brought even by disasters to believe the truth. Um... Back to another um, statement from Josephus, the same wonderful sign. And so this sign, I didn't include the text because it was kind of a long description, but basically what was happening in Jerusalem is that the springs would dry up, and the people there in Jerusalem could not get any water out of the spring. But then when the Roman army would take that area where the spring was, suddenly the spring would start flowing again. That was the sign that Josephus was talking about. He says, the same wonderful sign, springs drying up, you had also experienced of formerly when the aforementioned king of Babylon made war against us. And when he took the city and burnt the temple, while yet I believe the Jews of that age were not so impious as you are, wherefore I cannot but suppose that God is fled out of his sanctuary and stands on the side of those against whom you fight. Now even a man, if he be but a good man, will fly from an impure house and will hate those that are not that are in it. And do you persuade yourselves that God will abide with you in your iniquities, who sees all secret things and hears what is kept most private? So now the last hope which supported the tyrants and the crew of robbers who were with them was in the caves. Oh, this is... Um, this is speaking about uh, Simon. Simon was one of the leaders of the rebellion. And so uh, this, this goes back to them hiding in the caves. When I said I believe it was, it was a literal fulfillment too, that it says they were hiding in the caves and caverns underground, whether if they could once fly, did not expect to be searched for, but endeavored that after the whole city should be destroyed and the Romans gone away, that they might come out again and escape from them. This was no better than a dream of theirs, for they were not able to lie hid either from God or from the Romans. This rise of his, this is talking about Simon, out of the ground did also occasion the discovery of a giant number of others in the seditious at that time who had hidden themselves underground. So after the Romans breached the wall, came in and destroyed Jerusalem, there were people hiding in the caves under under Jerusalem also, and they were hoping that they would not be discovered, and they would just wait till the Romans left, and then, the, then they could come out. But, of course, they were found out also. And so it's interesting that uh, Josephus says that they were not just hiding from the Romans, but they were also hiding from God himself, which is exactly what... Um, that's exactly what we see being said of... Um, by John in the book of Revelation. Okay, so that concludes our study on chapter 6. 
Um, you know, any, anytime I go through the book of Revelation and I start reading it and comparing it to the historical record, I mean, the thing that comes apparent to me is that is what's happening. You know, there's a lot of evangelical Christians and, and Messianic believers and Hebrew roots believers that have this real love affair with, with anything Jewish. And to me, this is very sobering, seeing what went on with with this whole event. I mean, this was judgment upon the Jewish people. This was God divorcing Judah. And a lot of these these people that go, and they, they basically are worshiping the Jews in a way. You really should take a second thought about that. This is, um, you know, you're worshiping God's ex-wife. <laughs> and if you've ever... Um, if if you can imagine a man and he's got a, an ex wife and he's got a new wife, the ex wife will not only hate the man but they also hate the ex wife even more. And over the years, I've ran across quotes by Jews that say that that the god that they worship is actually Lucifer. Um, one day I'll probably make a video and show you some of those quotes and where they come from. <clears throat> But I believe it. If you look at some of the things they say about Yeshua and the Talmud, about how he's boiling excrement in hell and all this kind of stuff, I mean, they're, they're obviously very much anti-Christ. And the scripture says, you know, we know what the scripture says about the synagogue of Satan. But I made a video a while back about uh, abortion being America's Jewish Holocaust. And the, what I was trying to highlight in that video was the Jewish connection to abortion, which is very strong. Since then, I've, I've learned that it's not just abortion. Um, it's abortion. It's feminism. It's the, the open borders and the immigration into all the, the white Christian countries. Uh, like The gay porn stuff, all that comes from the same people. Um, and if that's not the synagogue of Satan, I don't know what is. You know, and, and, of course, then there's the banking cartels. Um, like all this stuff, all this stuff that's called conspiracy theories, it's not conspiracy theories. It's it's facts. It's uncomfortable facts. And if you if you try and talk about that, you're in, instantly labeled as being anti something. And it's it's akin to just shutting down down the discussion. But the reason that they're into all these industries, all these anti Christian industries, is because they do it. It's their war against Yeshua. And there was a period for many centuries where these people were ran out of white Christian countries. And, you know, they'll tell you that they were ran out of like 109 different countries, but they never tell you why. They don't tell you why they were ran out of these countries. And I think that them being expelled from all these countries was Satan being bound for a thousand years. And, of course, now... Now they've got their their claws into our government, and not just our government, but all the governments of the world, so deeply. And a lot of it is through the central banking. And I, I kind of think it's really going to take God to to root them out again. But um, but this this video and, the, and this subject really has opened my eyes to that. It opened my eyes the first time I read these books about the fulfillment of the Book of Revelation and getting back on this subject and making videos about it and, and restudying it has made that that much more apparent to me. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my take on this. And I uh, thank you for listening. We'll continue working through the book of revelation. Um, I, I do think I have thought from the beginning that uh, talking about this subject on, um, on YouTube is probably going to get me, shut down or get some of the videos uh you know censored or whatever if that does happen i'll make a video and post and just tell you where you can find me but if you look in the comment sections i do have a, a gab tv account um if you're not on gab the social media site i recommend getting on there uh it's it's kind of like a mixture of twitter and facebook but there's no censorship at all and people will say some pretty politically incorrect stuff but but it is um, a very, very free website as far as like freedom goes.
and there is no censorship there, so that's where I'm I'm kind of creating a secondary channel as a backup. Um, I'd rather you watch it on YouTube because at least I do get a little bit of ad revenue. It's not very much, but maybe once a year they'll send me a little bit of money. But um, if this sh if this channel does get shut down, or if um, if there is a video that I can't post because it won't let me, then you can find it on my my Gab channel, and I'll. If that does happen, I'll try to make a video and just say, hey, you're going to have to go to this other link to, to view it. But anyway, uh, thanks for listening, and I'll try to get, in, get into Chapter 7 as uh, soon as possible. Shalom.